We continue this conversation regarding big banks targeting conservatives and Christian organizations. I want to shift to my next guest, David Cox. He's the assistant director of the Arkansas Family Council, and I, they have a very close and personal experience with this whole issue of debanking. David, welcome to Washington Watch. Good to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. All right. So uh, let's begin with, with the story. Explain what happened to your organization. Sure. So, you know, obviously we're a conservative Christian pro-family organization in Little Rock, Arkansas. We've operated since 1989 and we rely entirely on donations from our friends for, for our funding. So like a lot of organizations, we accept donations via credit card. You know, our supporters expect to be able to give that way. And in 2009, or excuse me, 2019, uh, we began working with a credit card processor called WePay, which was a Chase Bank company, and had no issues, great service, no complaints. And then out of the blue on July 7th, 2021, at 1029 a.m., I received an email from WePay saying, unfortunately, we can no longer support your business. Uh, best of luck to you. We're closing your account. Very terse email. 60 seconds later at 10.30 a.m., we were no longer able to accept credit card donations online. Wow. We didn't get any explanation about what happened. Uh, we eventually learned that WePay's trust and safety team had closed our account because they had designated us as a high-risk organization. And we don't know what prompted that designation. We never got an explanation. Fortunately for us, we were able to scramble, and within a matter of hours, we had switched to a different credit card processor who aligned with our values and wasn't going to cancel us without notice. We were able to, to switch, and we were able to continue operating and accepting donations and uh, working with our friends. It, it didn't hamper us the way it might have other organizations, but we found it so troubling that such a major financial institution could treat a customer so unprofessionally to cancel an account like that with virtually no notice and no explanation. And what was especially shocking for me was when I began sharing our story, we found we weren't alone, that there were other organizations with very similar experiences. So uh, I'm afraid yeah. we may have been just one of many, but that was our, our debanking experience that we like to yeah, you know, and share. That's people, a powerful, powerful story, David, and thank you for sharing that. And you're not alone. That's why this is becoming an issue, and it is specifically uh, seems to be one that is targeting conservatives and Christian organizations. But although you were able to overcome that, it was still very close, was it not, a, a, uh, within a, just a hair's breadth of being a major threat to the existence of the Family Council. Could oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I looked at the reports. About one-third of our funding uh, comes from donations that we receive online. Uh, you know, if an organization loses that ability to process credit card donations electronically, even for a short time, it can be truly devastating. And, uh, you know, again, the, the fact that your account could be canceled with virtually no notice and no explanation, uh, that's, that's a very shocking reality, something that, that many people find disturbing. They don't realize that banks have this sort of power over organizations. And they are not in any way required to give you warning beforehand. They can just turn the switch off, so to speak. That's exactly right. You know, I went back and reviewed our, our customer service agreement. You know, the agreement that we all just check the box that says, oh, I agree, and we hit, you know, apply. Uh, I reviewed it, and I found that buried in that agreement was fine print that said, they could cancel our account for any reason or no reason at all, and that they could do it with virtually no notice. And that was very telling that that language was buried in our customer service agreement that we had to sign in order to do business with this banking institution. So would you encourage people when they are signing those and hitting the agree, 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 agree button uh, that that's probably not a good idea? There's some wisdom in knowing what it is you're agreeing to. There's always wisdom in reading the fine print. And, you know, what I tell people now is try to find businesses that align with your values. You know, we are seeing progress on the debanking issue with J.P. Morgan Chase and some others, but it still is good to find businesses that align with your values that 
aren't supporting an agenda that you disagree with. And uh, definitely, definitely uh, read the fine print. And, you know, if you can have a backup plan, ask yourself, what would I do if, if I no longer had this service available? Because, you know, in our situation, um, that was a reality for us that we, we woke up one day and all of a sudden we were unable to process donations via our website and uh, we had to scramble and put together a plan. I would not wish that on anybody. No, I wouldn't either. And that is very, very sound advice that you are providing right now. And I hope people uh, uh, pay close attention to that. You know, there, there has been, fortunately, a growing backlash to these mm -hmm. uh, debanking practices. I was just speaking with Jerry Boyer a few moments ago. Louisiana is the most recent to basically push back to Bank of America and say, you're going to do that here. You're no longer going to be doing business here in Louisiana. So all the backlash is great news, but it happened to you at a time uh, where not a whole lot of people were aware that this was taking place. Uh, so was it a, a case of uh, alerting the public to what was going on? How has all the, the backlash come about? You know, I think what I've seen personally is we were able to share our story with state legislators, and that resulted in a legislative action and executive action in Arkansas, where there's been a, some pushback against the ESG agenda. We've seen state officials take steps to make sure that state money isn't being used to support financial institutions that, that debank, basically. Um, but, you know, it gave us an opportunity once we started sharing our story. You know, we, as I said, found we were not alone, that there were groups like uh, the Ruth Institute uh, had been debanked. Uh, obviously, Ambassador Brownback uh, had uh, had been debanked by, I believe it was Chase Bank. And so as we began to, to share our stories with one another, uh, I think we were all able together to draw attention to this serious issue. And I think we've seen the fruit of that over the last couple of years as state officials have taken steps. And you, know, you see shareholders and other concerned citizens make their voices heard on this. So, you know, I see it as an opportunity. You know, it happened to us early on, but we've been able to, I think, be part of the solution. David Cox from the Arkansas Family Council, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your experience and your advice going through this process. God bless you. Y'all do a fantastic job there in Arkansas. Keep it up. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you. You too.